Welcome to Inside the WSL. We're out on the road this week celebrating Black History Month. So we've come here to Finch Farm to talk to Everton's Gabby George. Gabby, really good to see you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we're going to talk about your trailblazing career. But first, tell me, when did you first fall in love with football? Um, I feel like I was quite a sporty child, so I fell in love with football when I got to about nine and my dad found me a local team. Um, but until that point, I played any sport and every sport I could. Yeah, you used to be a sprinter, right? 100 metres, 200 metres? Yeah, that's the path I went down for a, a little bit until I joined United Centre of Excellence um, and then it became football or running and I went with football. So when you're playing football as a nine-year-old, so you're growing up in the early 2000s, what was people's reaction to a young girl playing football at that time? To be honest, I can't say I took much notice of it because <laughs> I'd like to think I was thought of as a, a strong-minded person. Um, so at that time, I was just playing football and having fun and I didn't care what anybody said or did. You weren't bothered. I suppose growing up in a big family, right? You were like one of seven. So you, you, I imagine you knew your own mind from quite a young age. Well, yeah, I feel like growing up in my household, you had to be strong because Otherwise, you weren't surviving. <laughs> um, and as the youngest, I was the one that used to get through about and told to do everything. So from a young age, I had to grow up quite quickly. Oh, gosh. So what was your family's reaction? How supportive were they of, of their, their young girl that wanted to play football? Well, I feel like my dad was buzzing, to be honest. I think we he's got a, f a lot of girls. I think there's six girls, one boy, and the boy never made it. And I don't think he even had any chance of making it so I think when I wanted to play football that was exciting for my dad and that brought us a lot closer because every day was football I used to sit outside the bookies where he was gambling waiting for him then we'd go on the field and play football and then we'd go home and watch football so it brought me a lot closer to my dad and I think I was like his his little boy at that <laughs> time because at the time it was a, a male dominated sport. So you'd go for kickabouts with your dad in the park? Yeah, my dad was my first coach. I think every day after school, he took me on the field and if I wanted to do something, he made sure that I was the best at what I did and he pushed me to where I am today. It's nice memories to have. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, he'd be buzzing watching that. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. So uh, initially, I think you played for Blackpool, was it, before you moved uh, to the Manchester United Academy. How much do you think your experiences at Blackpool, but also at United, kind of set you up for success now? Yeah, I think I got scouted for Blackpool playing for my local girls team. Um, and we didn't really know the magnitude of women's football at that time and where we could go and what the stepping stones were. So when a football club came in, my dad was like, oh, we'll go down. Obviously, it was difficult. My dad and my mum used to work nights sometimes, so they used to sleep while I was training. Then take me back and then they'd go straight to work and I'd get in bed for school um, and it become that it was getting too far um, so that's when I did move to United Centre of Excellence and that's when like the whole world of women's football opened up for me and when I started to see like Liverpool had teams, Everton had teams whereas when you was growing up you didn't know they had teams. That's incredible dedication from your parents to make sure that they could get you to a training session to a game. Yeah, I think they've put in everything for me to get where I am today and they're still extremely supportive to this day, home and away, and they love it. Um, my mum knows the rules of football like no other, so <laughs> she's loving it. Um, and obviously my dad, he is football through and through. Yeah, yeah. So just supports everything you do, comes to your games, you hear them in the, in the stands when they're there? Oh, yeah, you... You'll know who my dad is when, when you're there. He's calmed down a lot now. But growing up, obviously, I used to do athletics. And my dad used to be known for... I used to do every event I could. And I used to do the long distance. But me growing up, I was a winner. So long distance, you can't sprint the whole thing. But I couldn't get to grips with that. So my dad was like, I'll come out the crowd and <laughs> shout, go now when you need to start sprinting. So I'd be jogging around get to like the last 200 and all you'd heard was my dad come out of the crowd like go now and then and I was like shoo <laughs> and everyone used to go over to him like good <laughs> that's one way of winning a long distance race <laughs> yeah so yeah it's, I've got a very close-knit family that's lovely and you've got a football family really because you know your cousin Jesse Lingard plays for Nottingham Forest 
I mean, does it help being that he went through the academy system as well and you were playing football at the same time? Yeah, I think everyone that knows Jesse knows that he's a light-hearted person and he's got a great personality and he's always been there through my career and growing up and when I was playing at United he used to come down to Ayrshire Road where we used to play and watch some games there and he gets down to Everton when he can and he's a bubbly character and not everything's always serious with him which is good because you have someone to turn to where they can bring the positive out of every situation. Yeah so he supported you through your career has he? Yeah definitely I think having someone like that to look up to and in the calibre of football that he does play I think it is great for me like he was an England international. He played for Manchester United, which was the club that I supported growing up. So it was all it was all great. And then after Blackpool, after Manchester United, you moved to Everton um, in 2014. You're only 17 years old, but according to the Everton website, they said that they signed you despite lots of interest from other clubs. Yeah, I think I spoke to quite a few clubs when I was leaving United. As everyone knows, they didn't have a women's team at the time, so we all had to go and try and find out what our next step was. I think when I come and spoke to Everton, they was big on bringing young players through. There was players like Nikita Paris, Alex Greenwood, Fern Whelan. They was all here when, when I was visiting, and the manager inspired me, and I thought that this would be the place that I was able to actually break through and play women's football, which was always the aim, leaving centre of excellence. Yeah, they've got a strong heritage at Everton of, of developing young women's players. So many players have come through the books here. What was it like at that age, though? You're only 17, you're still a teenager, and you've got all this interest in you. Like, all these clubs want you. They must have, I don't know, been, been positive, but also been quite hard to deal with as well. Yeah, it was a difficult decision for me to make at the time because you never know what's right until you look back. Um, I think coming into a women's environment, I'm a big character and that woke me up big time. I think Scousers are always known to be hard. Um, so yeah, it woke me up big time and I don't regret any decision that I've made. Woke you up how? Oh God. <laughs> I mean, even the first pass I received, it was like bouncing off machines and they were like, come on, kid. And I was like, oh, dad, is this for me? Yeah. <laughs> and my dad was like, I went home one day and I was like, and he was like, you need to sort yourself out. And I was like, oh, I'll sort myself out, dad. Yeah. Welcome to the big leagues. Huh? Yeah. So mentally you had to get your mind right. Yeah. Um, I was quite a big character as well. And for that to wake me up, I was like, I, I dread for everyone else that's going through, <laughs> but it, it helped and I think that's what you need. You need to be pushed because at the time I was settling and I needed to be pushed to go where I wanted. Like I can't just come into a women's environment and go, I want to play first team football. Mm -hmm. You need to show why you deserve to play first team football and I'd like to think I did that after the first session. <laughs> got to earn it, right? You've yeah. got to earn it. Now as a Mank, did you ever think, oh my gosh, I'm crossing the Manchester Merseyside divide, or did, was it not? Was it not a part of your thought process? I'd like to think that Everton isn't crossing that divide. I think <laughs> <laughs> the other side of Liverpool, maybe, but okay. no. Um, it's grew to be home for me. Um, I've been here what eight, nine years, maybe, um, and it's all I've known in the women environment. So. Yeah. There's been so many positives to your careers, but you have had a few setbacks, in particular the ACL injury. And it's usually at times like that, when, when things are really tough, or things are really hard, that you learn the most about yourself. So what did you learn throughout that process when you were on the sidelines? Yeah, it gave me a big wake-up call in terms of life isn't just football. I think I fell into a place where everything was football so I'd be taking painkillers after painkillers after painkillers to get through games which obviously wasn't the best for me at the time but I hate not playing and that's me growing up. I, I'd do anything to play games of football. There's a very minimum games that you will find that I haven't played because I love the sport but I think sometimes putting your health first I realised that and also life after football you sit there and you're in a dark place and you're like what about if I never come back as the player that I left and what's next for me um so i started to reach into the pfa and doing courses off the back of it because you become lost because you don't have what you did have playing football you wake up you're in a routine but that routine was taken away especially it being locked down and 
it was all I knew, so yeah, it was difficult, but I think it's pushed me and made me mentally stronger than I'd ever be. Yeah, a lot of players tell me that when they're injured, uh, they lose their sense of identity because the football's been taken away. So who helped you? you? You reached out to the PFA, but were there particular players or people in your family that helped you through? Yeah, I think Everton were great with me, obviously. As everyone known, I had to wait four months for the surgery, which was probably the toughest part of my rehab, to be honest, because in them four months, I couldn't do everything. And that was because of the lockdown, the yeah. pandemic. So them four months, I couldn't do anything. It come to the time when I could actually do it and I smashed it all because it's something that's been taken away and it's like you've been pulled back to just go. Um, and I enjoyed every moment of my rehab. It was, it was difficult in them first four months, but as soon as I was able to hit the gym, hit the pitch. I enjoyed every minute and the club and the staff made me be able to enjoy that. They, they kept me involved in everything. We went to Wembley and I felt part of the team. I had my shirt hung up in the changing room. So it's just little things, but the club were amazing. And then obviously my family. I mean, my mum, if I cry, she cries. So sometimes <laughs> we just sit there crying, but <laughs> it's nice to sometimes just be able to let it out. And obviously my dad's not the softest of person. so. He's who I went to when I needed a shake up, like, come on, you can do it because if you cry, dad's like, What's she crying for? <laughs> Your leg's not fell off and I'm like, it has. <laughs> so, coach, physio, life coach. Oh, he's everything. <laughs> he's a he's a he's he's a, a mentor and more, isn't he, your dad? Literally, yeah. We're we're like two peas in a pod. We clash like nobody's business, but we're just the same person. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um it's good that you've made it back because You've had, a, I think, a successful time since you've come back. Would you say that? I mean, you were Everton's Player of the Year last season, weren't you? Yeah, I think making it back is probably my biggest achievement because I remember the first surgeon I went to see. Obviously, I knew the extent of the injury, but I didn't know the extent of... I just thought, you just do your rehab, you come back. It is what it is. And the first surgeon was like, it doesn't work for everyone. And I think that's when it hit home because I was literally like, wait, so are you telling me that I might not come back? And he was like, and I remember just, I walked out of that room and I think I looked like a seen a ghost and my physio looked at me and I just burst out crying and I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, no, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. But they were like, we have to be honest with you because it's the procedure. Um, so I think making it back was the my biggest accomplishment. And I think winning player of the season, that was just, the cherry on the cake, really. I think I played every minute I was eligible to play last season. Um, and that also in itself was a big accomplishment for me because I had a smooth rehab, I'd like to say, and then it was a smooth season for me because I didn't pick up any niggles. Um, and that was my aim going into that season to be able to be as robust as I can so I can compete and play how I want to play. And I think as the season went on, I started to get more and more comfortable. Yeah, it, it seems that way. I mean, one of your strengths seems to be just blocking players left, right and centre. They're like, you're like a brick wall <laughs> in the centre of defence. Do you work on your physique? Is that something that you, you try and become more of an intimidating presence so that when players look at you, forwards look at you, they're like, oh, no, it's Gabby George. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's kind of in the genes um, because I just look at a weight and build muscle. Um, so my rehab was a lot on lifting and getting strong again and I think I come back stronger than what I left and a big part of my rehab was to get stronger um so in that sense yeah but I'd like to think I don't look that scary no, no, no. <laughs> look scary you look like an elite athlete you know yeah that's good to hear which is the point right <laughs> yeah um and then you're playing in one of the biggest best leagues in the world and when you think of the WSL you think of the attacking talent that this league has Viv Miedemar, Sam Kerr, my goodness. Who do you enjoy coming up against? Which attacking players do you think, yeah, we're going to have a right ding-dong this match? <laughs> yeah, I think I enjoy playing against the, the top teams, your likes of City, Arsenal, Chelsea, United, um, because I like to test myself against the best. Um, and I think any elite athlete has that mindset. I think it's enjoyable being able to see where you need to improve or what what went well in that game. So I enjoy playing against any top opposition. Yeah, it looks that way. It looks like you, you, you kind of get yourself up for the big games, don't you? Yeah, I'd like to think so. <laughs> Definitely. Now, when it comes to England, um, 
you made your debut in 2018, now having played in all the age groups um, all the way through your teenage years. What was it like stepping out in 2018 to make your debut? How did it feel? Yeah, it was it was an amazing feeling. Um, I think it's something that you work hard for. I've always said I want to be an England international, and that moment when I found out that I was starting in that game, it, I'd been sat on the bench for a few quite a while beforehand and then when I actually got the moment um, I think I played left back that game and it was it was exciting it's what you dream of doing and I did it it was difficult because my mum and dad didn't come to that game um, oh, but I, I remember speaking to them before the game and my mum was crying <laughs> <laughs> there's a running theme here <laughs> he's gonna knock me out <laughs> but no they were messaging me like paragraphs about like how it made them feel and when I stepped out on the pitch, it wasn't just for me, it was for my family that I'd put in all the sacrifices to help me get to that moment and I did it, but it left me wanting more and obviously I then went on to do my knee, but I got a call up prior to the Euros and it made me feel like it was still in reaching distance, so it's obviously something that I'm still working on. First call up in three years, wasn't it? Yeah. How did that feel? Um, I remember it, I got called up from the under 23s camp, and Mo has been through the whole youth system with me. So she gave me my first England call up, and then she was the under 23s manager when they called me back in. And I was sat there and I had a mask on because it was COVID times. And <laughs> she was like, Are you happy? And I was like, Yeah, I need to go now. <laughs> but no, it, it was amazing. Really good. And I suppose the standards has been set. England are now European champions, so it's going to be even harder to get into that team. You've got the likes of Millie Bright, Leah Williamson in the centre of the fence. How do you become the person that replaces them? How do you get to that level? I think it's just performing week in, week out in the WSL in a team that is competing. I think last season was difficult, so for me to get a call up on the back of it wasn't the best season for Everton was... It was good for me, but I, I'd like to think if we could do better as a team and I can improve my performances, then hopefully I can get a bit closer. But obviously, first and foremost, I need to be competing and playing my best football at club for them to even consider me. Now, we've spoken about your career, but of course, we're celebrating Black History Month throughout October here on Inside the WSL. What does Black History Month mean to you? Yeah, I think it's a visual representation of the black people and the black sports people but not just sports like everyone from around the world and different countries I think obviously growing up there was very limited visual representation for black women in the in the game but I think there was the likes of Rachel Yankee which I did see and at the time I was a winger so <laughs> if I wanted to be someone it was a little Rachel Yankee um, so yeah, it means a lot and it means a lot to have something to celebrate us. Yeah, so I suppose a lot of people will say to me, if I see it, then I can be it. Is yeah. that how you feel? Yeah, I think that's very true. I think seeing someone that not just looks like you, but it's, you can show to have an example yeah. that you can, can be that. To. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very, it's important to have visual representation and Growing up, it, it was limited, but there was some. Um, and I think it is only growing to get bigger and bigger. Do you see yourself now as someone that needs to take on that mantle and be that representation, or do you just want to play football? Yeah, I think I just want to play football, but I do think being out there and the women's football growing and now we're on Sky Sports and BBC and other channels, I think little girls can sit at home and watch us and and we will be there and we will be in the eyesight and we will be able to show them what they can be. Mm, yeah. I, I, do you see yourself as a role model? Do you, do you take on that, that mantle? Are you, are you happy to, for a, a, a young girl to look up to you and say, I want to be like Gary George? Yeah, I think it's great to have. And even when you get little tweets and it's people that have got the, your name on the back of the shirt and stuff like that, it's just great because it's something what the game's never had, but it's just growing so big. And especially after the girls doing so well at the Euros, it's just getting bigger and bigger. And I think it's a great example and a great place for women's football to be. One thing you did say to me is that, you know, when you made your England debut, you weren't just representing yourself, you're representing your entire family. So do you feel as though you've that support from your family has helped you to become 
I suppose, more comfortable in the limelight, more comfortable being visible. Yeah, I think the way that I've been brought up and the family that I've got is we're all quite strong and sh straight to the point. And I think that was, I think that was a big thing for me growing up that I had that thick skin and I didn't really care what anyone said because I was happy and I was doing what made me happy. And I think that was a big part of what my family have drilled into me growing up. And what about the pathway for young black girls into the game? There's been quite, quite a, a lot of criticism because the top of the game isn't very diverse when it gets to the elite level of the women's game. So what about the pathway? How easy was it for you and how much do you think it's changed since you went through it? Yeah, I think there's a lot more centres now. I think the FA have tried to do more emerging talent centres, which when I was growing up, there wasn't many of them and they weren't easy to find sort of thing. Um, so I think now they're easier to find because there's loads of them. Um, and I think growing up, that's what we needed. So hopefully more people will get involved. And I think it's more looked at in like primary schools and high schools because in primary school, we didn't play football like... It was, I don't know, throwing a beanbag somewhere or something. <laughs> um, and then in high school we did, but I was fortunate because my PE teacher played football, so that's the only reason why we did it. But I think other schools and other people that I've spoke to, not girls didn't play football. It was girls do rounders, boys do football, and it was split like that. But I feel like it's now getting to a point where questions are asked if sport isn't played and football isn't played. So I think it's getting to a better place. Do you think you're already, you know, talking about your England career and you want, obviously wanting to become a regular as part of that team, a regular starter, are you ready for that level of visibility as a black footballer once you get to the top, top level playing for your country? Yeah, I think I want to become a regular because I'm a good footballer first and foremost. I think when it gets to things like that, you've got to be performing week in, week out and that's what I want to do. And then... Hopefully I will then become a role model for the young girls that are growing up and there is younger girls that do want to become a mini Gabby George and I've got my little sisters that I'm a role model for and they're the same colour as me and me being able to push to the top, they know that everything is open for them and they can be whatever they want to be and I make sure that I drill that into them because I want them to have dreams, I want them to have goals and them goals to be reachable. Wow, you're blazing a trail for your, for your little sisters. Yeah. They sound like they're going to be fearless because of what you've instilled in them. Yeah, they are fearless. <laughs> um, they're they're major, amazing characters. I think my little sisters are a big part of me. Um, they're both adopted, so giving them a life what maybe they would have never had before was a big part for me, and they are my bread and butter. I can see like, your eyes are just lighting up when you talk about them. Yeah, they're amazing characters. If they was here now, they'd be talking your socks <laughs> off. But, I mean, they've had hard, a hard life so far and they're only eight and ten, so hopefully their skin's thicker than mine. And if, if I can get them to that stage, then they'll be just fine. How do you deal with criticism when it comes to, not just you as a footballer, but you as a black woman? Yeah, I think um, I had quite a bit of racism in primary school. That's when it first started for me. Um, but I used to just laugh at it because it just didn't make sense. Like, I was really happy to be a brown skinned girl, so you're shouting stuff at me, that's my colour, and I'm like, I know it's nice, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it started quite young, but my dad, my dad used to tell me that it doesn't matter. So he was just like, well, you're not gonna change it. So I'd be like, no. And he'd be like, right then, so what are you crying about? But like, nothing. And he's like, well, off you go then, <laughs> come play. So I think it is all on mindset and, and how strong you are as a person to how you deal with it. You shouldn't have to deal with it. But unfortunately, sometimes it's, some people are just small minded and that's how it is. And I think being able to be happy in your body and happy in your skin is something that only you can give yourself. And I'm happy in my skin. So if anybody wants to take the mick out of that, then more for them. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it was positive for you having someone like Rachel Yankee to look up to. What was it about her? 
I, obviously, she was a very visible black player at the time, but what else was it about Rachel Yankee? It was the hair and everything. <laughs> I think having someone that looks like you, even yeah. like kids these days, like we get my little sister a little Barbie, Barbie doll with a little curly hair because that's what you look like. And it's being able to see someone that not just looks like you, but has features that are black, like the curly hair. Mm. And she was fast and I was fast at the time. And she was a winger, I was a winger, so I just used to think wow I can be that yeah and now someone's going to be doing that looking at you and thinking I want to be the next Gary George yeah I might need to get the curly hair back <laughs> <laughs> Where's it when's that coming back I don't know <laughs> Gary look it's been so great to talk to you get to know you a bit more thank you for sharing so many stories with us no problem it's been nice to talk to you thank you very much